is ready. He's what looks like in his little golf hitting bay inside of his pro shop. And he is Tyler Slocum. Welcome to On The Mark Podcast, bro. How are you? Yeah, doing well, Mark. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Um, we're in this series of recommendations from one instructor to another. And you were highly recommended by Ryan Hager. And to be honest with you, I've been watching your stuff on social media for a while. So it's a thrill to have you. And I look forward to introducing what is a much requested concept in how to build a good backswing. But before we do that, Tyler, let's get to know you some. Please, please tell uh, the listeners, the, the global audience about you, where you're from, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, a smaller town called Olive Branch, Mississippi. Uh -huh. It's just a suburb south of Memphis, Tennessee. Right. So when I was growing up, I grew up playing a lot of different sports, a lot of basketball, baseball, football. And I didn't pick up the game of golf until I was about 14. You know, I ended up that year, I ended up breaking my leg playing football, right. got a little burnout out playing baseball. So I had a lot more time on my hand. And that's when I really started going all into golf. So I ended up working at a golf course right down the road for free golf. It was a great place to practice and play because the guys I was competing with, I had to start getting better a lot quicker because they had a little head start on me. Mm -hmm. So I ended up playing, you know, all throughout high school. I ended up playing two years of college golf at East Mississippi. All right. And it was at that point, you know, I was, I was competing and I kind of had that realization that, you know, I'd seen a lot of great players. I didn't have what it takes to get on the PGA tour, but I was always fascinating with the coaching side of things. So I ended up transferring to Mississippi state to do the professional golf management program there. And I, and that's where I ended up graduating from. So through the program, I had to do a variety of internships. I want to stop you for a second um, so there quickly because a, a lot of our, you know, we get a lot of aspirant college golfers reaching out to us. And I've spoken to a lot of folks and folks who went to Mississippi State about that golf management program. It's worthwhile. Uh, talk a little bit about that for a minute, please. Yeah, no, it's great. So I was under uh, Jeff Atkerson. He was the director at the time. And Adam Scott was the assistant. He's the lead of it right now. I mean, it's just a phenomenal place and just a great culture about going about the ins and out and learning about the ins and out of the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, lucky for me, I knew I wanted to kind of, uh, focus more on coaching at an earlier age. But, you know, I've been lucky. There's a lot of people that have come through that program who've had a lot of success in different parts of the industry. Yeah. So you, you graduate from the program, but you said you always had a bent um, just toward the teaching and the coaching side of things. I mean, I, I'm interested because I was a player who was decent, who couldn't beat his younger brother. And that was my natural, um, my sort of uh, path into instruction. What, what made you interested in the teaching, the, the coaching side of it? Well, uh, you know, growing up at that, uh, the place that I grew up at, I would always get indoor pro shop lessons, just swinging the club. A guy uh, by the name of John Wells used to help me out. He really kind of showed me the ropes and taught me a lot when I was, when I was first starting out, but I was always just fascinated about learning more about the golf swing and how to hit certain shots. Uh, you know, I actually caddied in the pro-am at St. Jude, uh, the year that Patrick Harrington won two majors. All right. So I was up close and got to hit him. I uh, got to watch him hit a lot of different shots. And I mean, pretty, pretty remarkable how great of a ball striker. And it, yeah. it didn't take long to realize that I didn't really have that. So that's when I started kind of exploring more of the teaching round. Mm -hmm. Just always fast. I love taking lessons and just learning more about the golf swing. Well, speaking of taking lessons, um, you learned under one who, in my opinion, is one of the foremost instructors in the history of the game, really, in Jim McLean. So obviously you decide you want to teach, you go and uh, seek out the counsel of of Jim and you work under him for a little while before you move to where you are, right? Yeah. So I, I was lucky. I started working for Jim first in Dallas at his junior academy. Mm -hmm. And I think when I started, I was about 21 at the, at the time. So I, I worked there and then I ended up moving to Miami full time. And like a lot of guys, uh, I started as just a regular assistant. There was about eight of us. And really our responsibility was helping out with the operation, setting up lessons, assisting the teachers so there's just a lot of great teachers who have come through that system. So just mm -hmm. being able to exchange ideas. And then after about a year and a half of that, I ended up becoming his personal assistant for some time before I started teaching full time mm -hmm. for him. He's a hard worker, isn't he? 
it's incredible. I mean, he's still, I talked to him not long ago. He's still at it to this day. I mean, yeah. there's no quitting him. Well, I've gotten to so. meet you now. I know a number of folks. I know Jim well too. And I know a number of folks who've learned from him and all you guys are sensational guys and girls. In fact, like Karen Palacios is a dear friend, um, are tremendous golf teachers. And the one thing you all do is in typical Jim McLean fashion, you do a wonderful job of explaining the concept illustrating the concept and then jim mclean is awesome about drills and you guys have always got really good drills to learn the concept and create a feel so let's dive in shall we i i folks i offered um tyler the option of whatever he wanted to talk about and you fired me too and the one caught my attention because we've had requests about this and that's building a better backswing now before we go there i'm going to do what most folks, the Twitterati, you know them, uh, they're going to go, well, what's the importance of the backswing? Because I can find Shane Lowry, Rory McIlroy, Henrik Stenson, Jim Furyk, and they list a number, Bubba Watson, a number of backswings that look different, uh, Matthew Wolf. And then they're like, okay, go. So I'm going to let you explain and, and, and help folks to better wisdom and understanding about this. Yeah. So I think when you start talking about building a better backswing, I mean, the first thing to note is there's not a one size fits all, or there's not a perfect position at the top. That's going to help every single golfer out there. Mm -hmm. And like you just said, you're going to see a variety of different styles of, uh, of golf swings that, that work at the highest level possible. So when I start looking at what makes a better backswing, it's, it's really about creating momentum going back and to put yourself in a good enough spot that isn't going to compromise your transition or compromise what you're trying to do. I you know, love, so when I, 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 I love your descriptor of creating momentum and I want to camp there for a little while because it's amazing to me how so many really advanced player an elite player, you can see the backswing has a flow to it, momentum to your descriptor. And then you find so many club golfers and I'm sure you give thousands of lessons where it looks like it's labored and that backswing isn't necessarily a swing. It's more a movement of stuff. So, so, so talk a bit more there, please. Yeah. I mean, I, I think when you start looking at the best players, you know, they, they actually start in the setup. You notice that they, they're constantly moving even at their setup and they're, they're waggling, they're, they're moving pressure in their feet. And really the first thing that tends to start their backswing is actually a movement towards the target, you know? So this is when they'll have a little bump or pressure towards their front foot. Yeah. And this actually acts as a trigger so they can rebound off of, but I, but I'm a firm believer that this is going to help them with the sequence of the backswing. It's, it's typically going to help their rhythm, their timing, their tempo. And it's going to, like you said, look a lot effortless. It's it, the, everything's moving a little bit more efficiently. Hey, that trigger. Um, I'm lucky enough to have uh, Gary Player is a bit of a mentor. Um, and he's given me various lessons throughout my life. And to this day, as a golf teacher, he still quizzes me that I'm doing certain things. And the one thing I learned from Player, and I copied him, was the little knee kick, the, the trail leg knee kick in. And it was a trigger. And it sort of started me. And it's amazing how I just learned it because I thought it was cool. He never taught me that. He did say to me that, Ben Hogan said your right knee should never shift laterally. And so I just copied it because it was cool. And it's amazing now how if I try and swing back without that little bump, the trigger or whatever you want to call it, it's next to impossible to get any real, you know, rhythm into the movement. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And I mean, copying a guy like Player or Hogan, I mean, those guys played at the highest level for, you know, for decades. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I think it really sets the tone for, uh, for the movement going back. I mean, I, I just see a lot of players play this game very static mm -hmm. and then it gets very difficult to move, especially when you start factoring pressure and things like that, that they're going to face when they're on the golf course. Well, you talk about Hogan and you know, the, one of the things he preached about in his modern fundamentals book was spend a lot of time on the waggle and how to yeah. set up for the backswing. And he would waggle at different paces given the shot that was required. It wasn't all like one speed because he was getting himself into the flow of the shot. And then here recently, you talk about pressure movement. Uh, Carl Berkshire, remember, he was rocking back and forth one side to the other. And now you have folks like Bryson DeChambeau listening to him a little bit. So what you list there, I think, is as important as anything to, to just start the backswing well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, talking about Hogan, he always called that, you know, the first crossroad in the golf swing is that first move back. But, Mm -hmm. you know, when you look at a lot of players and, you know, Kyle does a a pretty uh, big job of like moving his feet, but at the tour level, they're moving. It just might not be, it might be a little bit more subtle, but Mm -hmm. there is that movement involved with most players. All right. So you would recommend a little trigger to most folks, you know, that little forward movement to kick the movement back. Is it as simple as just a little pressure movement in the feet or a knee press? Give some examples of, of, of what that could be, please. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, first, you know, just rocking the feet back and forth. Uh, you, you'll see a lot of players actually start to kind of press their hands forward a little bit before they start going back. Mm-hmm. I mean, anything that just sets the momentum, uh, you know, forwards so that it can go back. And Jim always used to use this, uh, this visual of if you had a big bucket of water and you were going to throw it, let's just say at the target, you would actually rock a little bit forward. So then you could kind of go the other way. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just, I think it's great for just creating some rhythm off the golf ball. Hey, I love that little forward press in the hands, but I've seen it more often than not. And, and I want you to teach folks, please where they might have that forward press, be it in their putting stroke or even in their full swing. But as they go into that forward press, there's that touch of re-gripping in the hands or they change positions of the hands in the movement. And then they just throw the club face relationship all over the place. Yeah. I mean, I think that can cause uh, really tension up in the hands through the arms. You know, I think it's important that, you know, everything's, you know, from the arm and the wrist level is staying relatively soft. So mm-hmm. your arms can be a little bit more reactive going back, you know, and that's, and we're going to get, you know, I would like to get into that in a second, as far as, you know, the, the movement of, if we move the right way, that momentum kind of carries our arms and the club back. It's not us just trying to necessarily put it in a certain spot. I love that. I really do because, and, and one of the elements you wanted to talk about, and we'll talk about the positions, the checkpoints, if you will. But you said, you talked about the dynamics of it all. And it reminds me of a quote that I heard from Jack Nicholas, where he was like, I swing the club through the positions. I don't position the club through the swing. And what you talk about then, for the folks who are listening on audio, Tyler was just showing the softness in the arms, almost like if you were swinging, you were responding to the weight of the club head. Am I correct in in, in what I'm understanding here? Yeah, absolutely. Again, we want our arms to react more through the pivot or through the momentum in this case. Mm -hmm. We don't want to try to squeeze and try to glide the club in certain spots because then we start losing that flow or that athleticism to our golf swing. All right. Um, we should be in a decent place to start. We've got the little trigger, the little bump forward to start the momentum. Let's, let, let's get into it here, shall we? Um, I, I loved your descriptor. I, I wasn't aware of the Hogan qu- quote where he called it a crossroads. Um, the start of the swing, um, I remember around David Ledbetter, he preached a good start like to everybody. I don't care what your skill level was because it set up everything. So, so let's start at the very start, shall we? Yeah. So as we just reviewed, we're, there's some the movement in the feet is set up and we have that initial trigger forward. So mm-hmm. that trigger is going to help us rebound. So you'll typically see a little movement to our trail leg or our right side. So I, I like to think of the engine of the golf swing as more of our midsection. So you can think of it as the rib cage, the hips, however you want to think of it, but there's going to be a little rotation back and that's going to take us to where the shaft is parallel. So a lot of people think about this as the takeaway. Now it's important when I start covering these different positions, it's really about how we move through them, kind of like you just said with the Jack quote, Mm -hmm. but it is good to kind of have certain spots to look at just so we have some reference points. So when I look back at the takeaway, when the shaft's parallel, pressure is moved to our, our right side or our trail side, we have some rotation. When you start looking at the club, we want to keep the club face under control. So Mm -hmm. typically with most players, this club face is going to be slightly toe down. Now, again, and you're going to catch up on a theme here. There's not a one size fits all for each player. You'll see certain players have it a little bit more closed. You might see some players with a little bit more toe, uh, toe up, but I think having it slightly toe down to where we're not manipulating the club face for the first move is very helpful. I, I now, to, the position- I, I'd, I'd love you to build on this for a little bit. Um, and folks, you can watch this on YouTube. Tyler is actually demonstrating what he was talking about. If you're listening on audio, um, that start, you know, where you from clubhead 
behind ball, kind of on the ground-ish, um, to where club shaft parallel. You, you talked about the rotation of the trunk, the torso. Is it largely driven by that and just passive hands, quiet, you know, quiet hands and wrists on this? And, and you're allowing... Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I think if there's some softness to our arms, this is going to be the driving force to get the club back. So that's just kind of gliding. Okay. Uh, when, when you look at it from the face on view, you're typically going to see the arms a little wider. Now it's, again, I can't stress this enough that they're soft, but I just see so many players, you know, at the club level or just your average golfer where they're, they're always talking about creating a lot of hinge off the golf ball. Mm -hmm. And typically when that happens, their body tends to shut off. So it gets very rigid or very manual set with the wrist. And then they kind of lose that overall flow to start the swing. I want you to talk about, because when, when I saw the, the caddy view, the front on view here, you hit a spot that I like to look for. Um, and I've spoken with a number of greats who, like Nicholas talked about low and slow off the ball. Freddie Couples does the same thing. You know, some of the folks move a bit faster, Nick Price, but they all create adequate width going back as they're rotating. There's some swing away of the arms. Um, and, and I saw you as you hit your shaft parallel position, how that handle was outside of your trail of foot and there was some good width built up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I just think it starts making the arc of our hands a little bit wider as well. But I just, I see when players tend to just break down with the wrist very early, it tends to ruin the structure of their arms. And typically it tends to shut off their pivot of how they move. I may be putting the cart before the horse a little bit, but I, I, I want to address it because that little hinge up action in the wrist jams the trail elbow in the side. And then a lot of golfers still mistakenly think that it's a good idea to keep that elbow against their side going back. And they, just destined for weak ball striking. Yeah, you know, I, I hear that a lot as well. And you just don't really see any of the best players in the world doing it. You know, I think that's that's such an important thing from a teaching standpoint when you're you're constantly hearing ideas and challenging your beliefs. Mm -hmm. But you always want to go back and see what the best players in the world are doing. You know, I don't see many, many guys or many girls on the LPJ tour where their elbow is attached to their body going back. They just don't quite get the width of their arms that you tend to see those players have. And along those lines, uh, it's, it's again, one of those things in the interests of doing something, you essentially remove the athleticism from the dynamic movement that is a fast swing over the club. Um, so you're right. Uh, creating that width to checkpoint number one shaft parallel is crucial. Um, one more thing about that shaft parallel position. If we were referencing the shaft's location, it's obviously parallel to the target line, but in, in relation to our body, like where is this? Is this over our toes, slightly behind us, out in front of us? What do you like about a good start? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, teaching, you'll see players in different spots. So I think it's important to have corridors of like what's acceptable and what's okay. not. Right. So, when, you know, like you said, a lot of players have this parallel to the target line. You'll see players have it maybe a little bit outside you know a guy like wolf has a very outside you see some players with it slightly in a tendency i see with the average golfer is they tend to get the club too far behind them or the club face too open early mm -hmm. and really from the first move off the golf ball they're kind of in a state of recovery they have to start making adjustments to their swing just to make up for a kind of a faulty first move so anytime that we can eliminate and get it a little bit sharper that's less they have to save coming down. Yeah, what you say there is so paramount for folks to understand that if you start and you get the club in behind you, the rest of the time you spend, you, you spend recovering, you spend reacting, and no amount of positive thinking is going to help that stuff on the way down. Um, okay, we, we, we've started off correctly. Let's uh, move dynamically to spot number checkpoint, let's call it number two. Yeah. So that would be what I consider, you know, left arm or lead arm parallel to the ground. So mm -hmm. kind of your three quarter position. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is your, your right side, you know, I always think of like kind of the obliques of the rib cage, but this is actually going to turn and start moving up a little bit. Now, the reason this movement is so important is you're going to get more rotation through the trunk, but as this starts moving up a little bit, that's actually going to satisfy our tilts, right? So the, since the ball is played on the ground, it's, it's so important that we rotate, but we also have the right amount of bends. 
So if I just rotate and I get way too flat relative to the ground, you can actually see my head and my body starts moving further away from the ball. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a lot more challenging coming down. So when this starts pulling back, you can see my left shoulder and my left hip are going to be a little bit lower. And it just keeps me a little bit more of my posture, you know, at this position, when you look at, you know, from the caddy view, typically the pressure would start moving back to the right heel mm -hmm. and around this position or the spot in the swing, that's when players tend to max out their pressure in their back, back leg or back foot. Okay. So, so, you know, so, and, so let me, so, so let me, I just want to clarify for the folks who aren't watching. So when you got the lead arm parallel with the ground and that rib cage, I love your descriptor there, sort of rotating behind you and you're on your tilts. Uh, that first off is huge for folks to realize because so many folks, they're like, well, I want to hit it farther and I've got to turn more, turn, turn, turn. And the next thing they're turning so big that they're turning so level, your point that they can't get the club back down consistently. But I will love what you say about the, I want you to camp on the pressure thing because a lot of folks, They've got to try and get behind the ball too in the heads. So they start going off to the right and they're going to the right and they never get back to the left fast enough. Yeah. You know, I, I see that where you get somebody that they, they might turn better, but then they just kind of stay there too long. And then they yeah. don't, we're going to get another second, but then they don't get their pressure back soon enough. So then that's going to tend, that's going to lead to some contact issues, going to have a difficulty controlling the low point of the swing and just striking the ball in the middle the club phase so to summarize uh, checkpoint number two your uh, the rib cage is turned behind you pressures into the trail heel pretty much maximum uh, lead side is turned lower uh, clubs uh, left arms parallel with the ground um again you you're going to allow a corridor for the shaft pitch at the situation because that's dependent on yeah. where they were starting right yeah absolutely so you know when you start looking at the arms and the club kind of at this you know left arm parallel position you know because our body is, is rotating, that's actually help our hands gain some depth. So our hands are actually going to start working a little bit in and a little bit up. And I, I think you, you actually, if, you, if you're on YouTube or social media, that's a very popular topic. But I think it's important to know that that's achieved from our body. It's not just bringing the arms in because that tends to ruin the structure of our arms. So important there. Yeah. Depth, lead arm depth, lead arm depth. And then you find golfers swinging across themselves so badly. That's something to remember because the one thing if folks are watching, you've got to always remember that the golf ball's in front of you and you stand parallel into the side of this thing and you're swinging on an arc. And if you get too far behind yourself, you're going to have to recover the wrong way or you'll hit too far from the inside also. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's just going to tend to shift the low point. If you don't swing over the top from there, you're going to tend to hit too far behind the golf ball. Mm. And then folks who are trying to get lead arm depth are wondering why they're having to early extend to get back to it. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll stop. Um, all right. So, so we've hit, uh, that was one, that was two. Where's three, please. So I would say the very top of the backswing. Uh, and this is when the, the club finishes it, you know, the travel back. Mm -hmm. So this would be the big part of the golf swing. I think there's some misconception of this, especially with golfers. A lot of golfers think that they're supposed to take the club all the way back and then swing it all the way through. And I, I love a quote that Jim or, you know, how Jim used to describe it is he always described it as a two way move. So okay. when the left arm is parallel to the ground, we talked about pressure being maxed out on the right. So as you continue to wind going back with your body, pressure actually starts moving back to the front foot. Mm -hmm. So when you reach the top of your backswing, Pressure is actually going to be pretty much 50, 50 or close to that. And again, a lot of golfers that tend to struggle stay too far back for too long. So, okay. you know, the, the better golfer from there is just going to tend to slide just to, you know, be able to find the ball from there. I want to ask you this too, uh, because well, everyone talks about Hideki Matsuyama, but the truth is because I've watched him over the last few years, he's largely eliminated that long pause at the top of his backswing. And so many golfers are like, well, when I swing up and I stop at the top, I actually hit the ball better. But that stop at the top isn't them stalling the club. It's just their body going in the opposite direction. So it's sequencing them better. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think like stopping at the top can be a great drill if you're working on certain, you know, arm structure, things like that. 
I think it's important to note that if you're really working on sequence, I wouldn't overdo that drill because a lot of times when you start overdoing that drill, it kind of teaches you to keep your pressure too far back for too long. So yeah. then you lose that, you know, that nice change of direction there. Tremendous. Um, talk to us a little bit more at the top now. Granted, we're going to get shafts pointing in different directions. And, you know, you might have a fo someone with a lead arm a little higher, a la Justin Thomas, and then you'll have someone a little deeper. I can't think of one off the top of my head. But, but let's talk about, again, the tilts of the body, where the arms are located, and just how you like to sort of see the shaft and the club face at the top. Yeah, you know, so I think as you get further on in your backswing, you'll actually see the corridors get maybe a little wider. So okay. you'll see, you know, a player like Justin uh, Thomas has his left arm pretty high. A guy like Matt Kuchar has a really low or flat left arm. Mm -hmm. yeah. But typically, I think a safe uh, spot, if you're moving your body well, you've got your tilts, this, is, this left arm is going to be maybe slightly above the shoulder plane or somewhere in line with it. Okay. Now, again, it all de uh, depends on how you move coming down. If you're, you know, a slicer of the golf ball and you're just picking your arms up, you might want to implement a little depth with your hands, but make sure it's happening the right way. Um, let's talk about, uh, because a lot of folks are like, well, I keep my head down, right? So they get their, their eyes glued to the ground. Their chin never moves. They just like got eyes on the ground because they got the fear of God put into them that you're going to keep your head down. Uh, I, I want you, because as you're talking there, it looks like everything in your body is opened up and your right side's gotten in behind you, your trail side, and, and that frees up the neck. Uh, talk to folks a little bit about at the top, if, to, if they have to really keep their head down or if they can have their eyes and, 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 and nose drift a little bit. Yeah, you know, I, I think that that's a great, you know, topic there because, you know, that's all you hear is you want to keep your head perfectly still. Mm -hmm. But the golf swing is very dynamic and athletic, so there will be some head movement just because, you know, it's a pretty complex moving. Yeah. On the other side of things, you have to be aware of if your head is moving excessively too much, yeah. that's going to make it a lot harder to control the low point or where you strike the ground. And I think it's important to understand, you know, you have to teach certain skill levels different, you know, for a very new golfer who has a really tough time just making contact, you probably don't want the, the head moving excessively, but you do want to teach them to turn. But mm -hmm. for better golfers, I mean, especially with a driver, the, the head's not staying perfectly still. That's a great way to, to not have a lot of club head speed, to be <laughs> honest. Yeah, this is the truth. And, and then I guess along those lines too, I, I want you with the head rotation and where the arms go back, I find a lot of folks turn back and likely if they turn too level with the shoulders, they go a little too far, they lose the, the, the wind up. So if they're decently on their tilts and then in an effort to then allow the arms to go farther, the trail arm just starts to fold and everything collapses. You've used the term arm structure, which I love. The structure is just given up over there. Talk to folks about width and how the arms, the, the trail arm should be at the top, please. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times if you move, let's just say inefficiently, right? So when I look at players and their elbows really start to, to split apart, a lot of the times that's happening for a reason. It's, it's an inefficiency of how they're moving. So okay. typically I'll try to make them move a little bit better going back, but then you start looking at the importance of the trail arm. And I think this is a big influence on where the club is at. So looking at the caddy view, for most players, I don't like to see this right arm or trail arm fold more than 90 degrees because when that happens, you just get a lot of runoff. You're going to get a lot of late movement of the club, which is going to influence the transition. Yeah. So, you know, and, and again, this doesn't have to be exact, but typically you'll see players a little wider, maybe somewhere around 90, 90 degrees here. And then from the, the down the line view, the, the forearm is a little bit more vertical, the elbow pointing down. That's a lot of it's going to depend on your range of motion and things like that. Isn't it uncanny how when a golfer keeps that trail elbow wider than 90, how they suddenly feel like, whoa, I've got to rotate my torso a little bit better to get this thing to what feels like full. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that helps a lot. Of, you know, that's, that's almost exactly what I tell a lot of players who struggle because then they have to start recruiting different segments of the body just to feel like they're making a backswing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times if it feels like a much bigger turn, but like a shorter arm swing going back. All right. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to morph into Brandel Chambly for a couple three minutes here. Um, where are you? 
personally, I, I, I'm free with it because folks' mobility levels vary. Uh, where are you on the lead heel and whether it should stay planted or lifted? Because I came from an era where um, I was just, I'm just old enough to have been around the old schools. And I'm just young enough to have been around when all of a sudden folks were teaching you to stay grounded in both feet pretty hard. So, so what do you advise golfers when it comes to the lifting of that trail foot, that forward foot in the backswing? Yeah. So I, I have no issue with the, uh, the lead foot coming up. I think, and again, you're, you're picking up on a theme, theme of like, it's how it's done. That's important. Mm -hmm. So it's okay if you're turning and you're using your body efficiently that it, the heel starts to raise, especially when you start looking at driver and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think for people who don't move as well, they actually need that just because they tend to lack, uh, you know, the rotation through the trunk. So that, that part's fine. But I think just like actively lifting the foot might not be the best uh, way to go about it. But yeah, no issues whatsoever with it lifting or coming up in the backswing. Okay, this is going to sound kind of odd, but, but I'm asking this to you as a fan now, and, and I'm trying to put myself in the listener's shoes. Yes, the top of the backswing is defined because there's two-way movement. You know, when you're approaching arms above the shoulder, the lower body's going the opposite direction. But how does one sort of know where the top of one's backswing is? Because there's also this delicate thing here where often I, I find personally, because my swing's built more in rhythm, that in the interest of activating my lower body on the way down, I don't necessarily get back enough and everything is just thrown cattywampus. So, so, so what's your advice over there? Yeah. So great point. So if you're turning and it's coming up, that's fine. If it helps you get a little bit more rotated, yeah. but you do need to make sure that you plan it and get your pressure back forward soon enough. And I think the timing of that for a lot of people, it would change from person to person. However, a lot of players probably need to feel that that happens a little bit sooner. You know, they probably need to feel like it's happening maybe even for a lot of people halfway back, just so it, you kind of achieve it at the top of your swing. Mm. And, and and there's an abstract element that's on at play here because you're right when you're like halfway back and your low body's starting to go in the opposite direction you've got to try and still stretch your upper body against that you mustn't just suddenly give up and go in the opposite direction uh, am i right in my assumption over there yeah you know if, if you're doing this there is going to be some separation yeah. of the mm -hmm. the upper lower body there but that that's going to be initiated first by getting pressure uh you know, going forward, Fantastic. you know, the force of things is, is going to proceed the motion. Okay. You've done a beautiful job of illustrating, explaining all of the four checkpoints. Um, speaking about the dynamic swinging element of it. Uh, I know you probably do. And I've seen you on social media have some great drills. Do you have some drills that you can share that folks could practice, you know, to try and hit certain positions or at least try and you know, maximize and, and get the most benefit of, of what is a well wound up sound backswing? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the first one, and I, I, I've seen Jim and a, a variety of teachers do this, Dr. Kwan, where you're setting up to the golf ball and you're actually going to hit some shots where you pump the club forward mm -hmm. before you take it back. So you pump it forward, the pressure would go to your front foot and then that helped you get the pressure moving in the same direction as the club. So you would have a little limited on space, but you'll go forward, take it back. And that's going to tend to help the overall flow of the swing. I think that's a great way to uh, learn a nice movement, especially if you're somebody who has a little hip slide to the target or tends to reverse pivot. Right. For, for the folks listening, um, Tyler did a beautiful exhibit there. And it reminds me of something that a dear friend of mine, Nick Price, probably to this day still does. And he could hit the rear end out of a golf ball. Um, you start with a club head out in front of it and you essentially swing the club head back from in front of the golf ball. And you can hit like that too, but it's a beautiful way to sort of give that club head a running start and get everything uh, swinging freely. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I think it's a great drill just to, to feel athletic. You know, I just see a lot of, a lot of golfers, they get very mechanical searching for positions in an attempt to hopefully they play better but just learning to kind of move their body a little bit more efficiently tends to help them uh, actually achieve the positions that they're looking for. So what would you say to me? Because <laughs> I've experienced this. So I'm going to ask you now. So I come to Tyler Slogan for a lesson and I do that drill. Or you say to me, hey, Mark, let's do this. And I do it to you. And I'm like, 
hey, Tyler, it feels like it's swinging the club into a different position going back than what I'm accustomed to, because it sometimes does. What would you say to me? Uh, I mean, that's where, you know, I think the, the use of like video, just so we can kind of see you know, where you're at, you know, sometimes it could be in a better or worse spot, you know, just depending on, you know, the type of shots you're trying to hit and things like that. But that's understanding, you know, sometimes that's, that could be a good thing mm -hmm. to feel, you know, your body in different positions. All it just depends on what you're working on or what, you know, what we're looking for. I, uh, I had a client yesterday and we were doing this very drill. But her goal wasn't, she was swinging nicely and was striking it well. Her goal was a whisker more speed. So I said to her, you've got to get into a speed mentality a bit here. And so we started with a club head in front, swung it into that motion like you did with the body moving. And she felt that her start to her swing was a little faster than what it had been because she was like super pedestrian going back and then trying to super accelerate on the way down. So everything got out of whack a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great way uh, to speed up somebody's golf swing is to actually get them moving the club faster going back because then a lot of times they'll start recruiting different areas of their body. You know, and again, it's not a one size fits all. I think you see a Morikawa has a really slow, you know, first few feet off the golf ball and then it kind of starts flowing a little bit. But, you know, I think if you're in 10 or your goal is to, to pick up some speed, I think anything that primes your body to move faster. I mean, sometimes it can be that simple, a lot of momentum drills like we're talking about, but just learn to move your body at a faster rate. I, I, it, it sort of leads me to another observation and I want your commentary here. Um, some great drivers of the golf ball, you referenced Kucha earlier. He does it. He hovers the club before he goes with a driver, he does it with the irons as well. And then, you know, Greg Norman was one of my favorites. He could drive it like one of the best ever. He hovered the driver above the ground to start, but a lot of that was to create that free flow of the club head into the backswing and to set motion up. Yeah, absolutely. And then a guy like Jack Nicholas did that yeah. as well. But I think when you hover the club, especially with the driver, you can feel the weight of the club a little bit. So okay. it tends to, it tends to help, uh, kind of sequence things a little bit better, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's easier to start moving your body uh, better going back. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that's great. Well, we've got, we've got one great drill already as used by Nick Price and many folks and Tyler Slocum teaches it. So that's club in front swinging into the backswing. Um, anything else you care to share that could help folks uh, make their backswing count a bit better? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love using alignment sticks. I think they're easy. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, for my time uh, spending with Jim, I think drills are so important for people because when they leave the lesson, they need the feedback and they need to make sure they're getting good feedback when they're practicing by themselves. Yeah. So I like uh, kind of attaching this alignment stick as an extension of the club. Right. So basically what we're doing here, this is for the player who tends to get very flat early. Okay. Now, when I, when I have this club very flat, it actually feels a little bit heavier. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of you slicers out there, that come over the top, a lot of times you'll see them get very flat and then they start to swing a little over the top and the club starts feeling lighter coming down. So we actually want to reverse that order. So this is where you would turn, you'd feel like the butt of the club or the alignment stick points, maybe even a little inside the target line. And again, this is going to feel a lot lighter. So we're learning to take this club up a little bit steeper so then with, with good body motions, that's going to help facilitate this club laying down a little bit more in transition. Hey, uh, folks watching on YouTube, uh, listening, you can check on YouTube. Describe for the audio listeners, please, Ty uh, Tyler, how you held that alignment stick against the club shaft, because this to me is a wonderful drill to get the massive, to feel the weight of the club, but also to know where yeah, the shaft all, pitches. All I'm doing is uh, holding the alignment stick on the back end of the club to where it sticks out a few feet. So again, this is just giving me a reference point. And then it's going, you know, for the right-handed golfer, when you start, the alignment stick is going to be a little left of your body to start. Yeah. But basically, this is just helping you get a visual of where this club is pointing. And then, I, you know, I, I love doing drills where you start closing your eyes just so you can get a better sense of what you're feeling and getting a little... Uh, uh, a little better feel of what your body's doing when you're doing this. I think it speeds up the learning process. I guess I'd be remiss 
because I love what you're doing there. But I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to address the wrist position there, because for the folks not watching, Tyler was swinging with the alignment rod sort of attached to the shaft as a reference with a club shaft looking a bit more vertical with left arm parallel. Um, talk to folks about wrist position in that area, because a lot of folks in the interest of hinging the wrist sometimes get a bit too, too cupped to me in that situation there. Yeah, you know, and, I, and that's, you tend to see that with, with high handicap golfers. Now, a lot of your wrist positions, your grip is going to influence that a lot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for most people taking it, you know, and I'm just taking it back to left arm parallel here. You know, there's going to be a little set of the wrist, but the important thing is that your left or your lead wrist is, you know, somewhere closer to flat, I think is safe. You know, you even have some players with a little bit more bow, but it's just finding out what works best for you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, typically when you start copying it, the club face tends to get a little too open. I'm, I'm so glad you referenced the grip's influence on that because, uh, again, social media, internet, folks spend time listening to podcasts like this. And there's a real movement nowadays to getting that wrist more beefed up at the top of the swing and get it more bowed or um, inflection. Uh, I'm glad you, you addressed that. And I'd like you to spend some more time over there on just understanding where the face should be and what your wrists do to influence that face location. Yeah. So, you know, the more you bow your wrists or flex your wrists, if you will, a lot of, play, you don't want a, a really strong grip because yeah. for a lot of players, it gets the club maybe a little too close, uh -huh. you know? So a lot of it depends on how you move coming down. So you will see a lot of players, even in the top 10, they do have this nice look of having, uh, some bow in their left wrist, typically they have, not always, but typically they have neutral to weaker left-hand grips if they're a right-handed golfer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't mind the club face being a little bit closed, but it all depends on how well you move and rotate. If you're somebody who doesn't move very well or doesn't have a lot of club head speed, looking at some of these models like a Dustin Johnson might not be the best model for you because you're not going to be able to get the ball up in the air as much. And you're going to have a, a big issue with that club face, you know, being close to your target. You're preaching Reverend. Uh, that, that is wise, wise stuff. And I want folks to re-listen to that. Not everyone can, not everyone can afford that or has the speed to do what Dustin does. Um, I've kept you for a long time already, Tyler, but I appreciate you. Um, I know you're a Jun McLean disciple. There's got to be one more drill that you can share with us. Well, if so, what is that? Yeah, so this would be uh, just kind of the movement of your trail arm. Okay. So you can just do some rehearsals. You know, you would grip the club with just your right hand if you're the right-handed golfer. And all you're going to do is just take your left hand and hook it around uh, your right arm to where the back of your knuckles of your left hand are on your right tricep. Mm -hmm. So what this is, doing is this is going to help clean up the structure here. So my elbow is going to be a little bit more down to the ground. This is a great drill for somebody who tends to kind of let that right arm fly a little bit too yeah. much. And you can see how it has such an influence on where the club goes. So just this is going to help you feel better right arm mechanics, essentially. I've used that thing more often than I could ever count. Um, I want to I, I want to I want to add this to it and I would love your take doing that exercise with that right wrist underneath your, pardon me, left wrist underneath your right tricep, you start to feel the club head because you're only holding it with your trail hand and you can feel the mass of the club head swinging into the backswing too, as you placing the resistance on the tricep of the right arm. Yeah. You know, I think it helps give you that, uh, that vertical piece. And like you said, the club's going to start feeling a little bit lighter as a result. Yeah. And again, I think it, uh, when I look at the masses of, of golfers, most people tend to slice the ball. So, you know, I think the more you can, you can turn and get this club feeling lighter again, it's just going to set you up and make it easier for you to get the club coming from the inside on your downswing. Uh, I think if there was a, a, a parting shot, I, I, I might be trying to preempt you a little bit here, but, on the backswing, that shaft pitch, the angle that it's sitting on, and I think of a Nick Price, I've watched him at countless golf balls, shaft a bit more up going back, and it naturally then shallows on the way down. But so many golfers roll that thing flat, and then they've heard on the internet they need to shallow more, and then they help themselves from the frying pan into the fire. Yeah, you know, they, they, they almost try to do it way too soon. And, it, you know, if you take the club really, you know, flat and low, 
it's very hard to then drop that club further from the inside because then you're never going to find the golf ball. So instinctively from there, they're going to tend to revert back to that over the top move just to play, you know, so it, it can be challenging at first, but I recommend like in, in, anytime you're working on changes, step away from the golf ball, do some mirror work or some video work just to get the movement right. Mm-hmm. And then set yourself up for success. Go real like almost walk through speed and just yeah. when you're doing it, it doesn't matter how you hit the first few shots, but just try to change the motion first. Yes. you. Well, that's such a, that's a wonderful take because when you're changing where this club shaft and club head are swinging, you, it's going to feel way, way different on not just your hands and wrists and forearms, but on your body as well. Yeah. And you, I think it's important. You're not so caught up in the results right away. Mm-hmm. You know, I can, I can show somebody their swing and I'm sitting here saying much better. And then they hit one off the hosel, the first swing, you know, it just takes some, some repetition of doing it the right way just to learn to kind of coordinate the change and define the golf ball from there. It doesn't always happen. Swing number one. Fantastic stuff. I'm going to give you, uh, I want to give you the last word before we sign off here. Is there anything you want to leave the listeners with please Tyler? Yeah. So, so getting, just focusing on the backswing, it's good to have these reference points in your backswing, Mm -hmm. but it's really of how we blend the motion to get there. So I want you to start doing uh, drills that kind of um, incorporate those motions. Don't get so caught up in nailing every position because then you're going to lose a lot of the flow and athleticism. And we need that to play our best golf. Yeah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Tyler. <laughs> First gospel. It's wonderful stuff, my friend. Um, I'm sure the folks are going to want to find more from you. Uh, is there a website? Share the social media handles and such, please. Yeah, it, it's just my name, Tyler Slocum Golf, on uh, you know Instagram and I think like TikTok. And I'm, I also have a website that links on my Instagram account. It's just tylerslocumgolf.com. All right. And then uh, we're in the series where we're doing recommendations. So you were recommended. Who is your recommendation that we're going to get on next? Yeah, I think John Schaff would be a great addition to the show. I, uh, I worked with John at McLean, but phenomenal teacher, works out at Rolling Hills in California, mm-hmm. uh, works really uh, under Devin Bonebreak and a few guys, but phenomenal teacher, really good guy. And I think he'd, he'd have a lot of good information to share. All righty, folks, look forward to that one. Tyler, in the meantime, thank you for your time and all your insights. I really appreciate you. Mark, thanks for having me on.